Welcome to the Development Study Seminar. Um, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Alberto Toscano, who's here today to talk about the invention of the savage, philosophy, politics, and the ideologies of development. Alberto is a reader in critical theory and the co-director of the Centre for Philosophy and Critical Theory at Goldsmiths at the University of London. His books include The Theatre of Production, Philosophy and Individuation Between Kant and Deleuze, Fanaticism on the Uses of an Idea, and with Jeff Kinkle, Cartographies of the Absolute. Um, he has translated several works by Alan Badiou, as well as Antonio Negri, Furio Jesse, and Franco Fortini. Um, he has sat on the editorial board of the journal Historical Materialism since 2004, and he's series editor of the Italian list for Seagull's Books. He's currently working on two book projects, um, the first on tragedy as a political form, the second on philosophy, capitalism, and real abstraction. Alberto is going to speak for 45 to 50 minutes, um, and then we will hear a response and some comments from Dr. Subir Sena, who is senior lecturer in institutions and development from here in the department. And then we will take questions from the floor before we have final summing up by Alberto. If you're tweeting, um, then use the hashtags SOASDevStudies and ESRC. Um, I am obviously chairing, so I'll be waving notes around if anyone goes on for too long. Um, and um, I think we're ready to start. Okay. Over to Alberto. Well. Many uh, thanks to the department um, and to um, uh, Sabir uh, also for being a respondent and to all of you for coming along. Um, and also especially to Faisy for the uh, invitation. So um, this paper is part of a, a project to engage in a sense from the angle of the history of philosophy, which is something I've dabbled in uh, with uh, the question um, of the savage and the place of the savage in the genealogies and um, conflicts even within the European uh, philosophical tradition as part of a way to engage with uh, contemporary debates about the decolonization of philosophy and of the curriculum more uh, broadly. And part of it was actually uh, the effect of a brief um, visit uh, as a visiting uh, lecturer at Simon Fraser University in uh, Vancouver, uh, and partly occasioned by the fact that the whole figure of the, the Canadian was already present in early 18th century French and German philosophy as a sort of object of speculation by which Canadian was meant uh, the indigenous population, especially of what is today called uh, Quebec. I won't talk about that today, but I just wanted to sort of note some of the sources for the project. So the talk has a, an epigram from sorry, the uh, um, French political anthropologist Pierre Clastre, who I'll return to uh, towards the conclusion. He writes in uh, a very important essay, Copernicus and the Savages, from his book, uh, Society Against the State. It is imperative to accept the idea that negation does not signify nothingness, that when the mirror does not reflect our own likeness, it does not prove there is nothing to perceive. So the widespread call to decolonize philosophy and the social sciences demands a preliminary assessment of the shaping power of the colonial relation across different disciplinary histories. Such an inquiry will involve an excavation of how the European encounter with and exploitation of other peoples conditioned the different forms taken by what the French philosopher Etienne Balibar has called the problem of anthropological difference, which is in part also, of course, the problem of otherness more broadly. My concern tonight is to explore how philosophers adopted, adapted, and transformed, and in a sense invented, the figure of the savage from the mid to late 16th to the late 18th century, the savage is a kind of living negation or inverted image of so-called civilized Western humanity. Further, I'd also like to think about how this invention was entangled at key junctures with the emergence of some of the ideological components of later conceptions of development, as well as the seeds of the critical appropriation of political economy in historical materialism and Marxism more broadly. 
Now, from Horkheimer and Adorno's location of anti-Semitism within the dialectic of enlightenment to Said's Orientalism, from Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex to Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, the critical history of Western philosophy and rationality has abounded in explorations of the intimate, if often obscure, bonds between the speculative subjection, so the kind of ideal subjection of otherness and its social material effects, or broadly uh, has reflected on the ideological and, and material and political role uh, of forms of uh, othering. The blatant instrumentality of the idea of the savage to the colonial project, from the Spanish conquest to the ongoing dispossession of indigenous peoples across the globe, would appear to militate against any sustained and nuanced exploration of the idea. It just seemed to be a kind of crass tool for uh, colonial or imperial rule. Surely, we might be seen to be dealing with the bluntest of racist and legitimizing myths, something to be fought politically rather than discussed academically. Now, for all the partial truth of that statement, in what follows, I want to propose that in part, contrary to this justifiable reflex, there is much to be gained in an investigation of the uses to which the idea of the savage was put by European thinkers in the crucible of colonial modernity, including for contemporary debates about decolonization of an academic or perhaps even more practical sort. So what kind of other is the savage? At first, and perhaps second and third glance as well, the savage seems to differ from the others that have so magnetized 20th century critical thought. It seems to lack the unsettling, subversive qualities which reason's confrontation with alterity is often deemed to have, for instance, in texts like Foucault's History of Madness, for instance. Reflecting recently on the articulation of difference, otherness, and exclusion in the phenomenon of racism, Balibar, in dialogue with Edward Said's Orientalism, presents that book as a paradigmatic study of something like an essential otherness, an uncanny double. Um, an uncanny double, double Said, um, Balibar says, regarding Said's uh, uh, book, who is not only an adversary, but embodies a negation of one's moral and aesthetic and intellectual values. Another who, at the same time, in the most contradictory manner, has to be constructed as a passive object of representation, study, dissections, classifications, and an active subject, so another who is also an active subject of threats, or simply of an alternative path to civilization and salvation. He goes on, here's the quote, the construction of the other is a construction of an alienated self where all the properties attributed to the other are inversions and distortions of those vindicated for oneself, where indeed the self is nothing but the other's other whose identity and stability is permanently asserted and secured in the imaginary through the representation of an essential other or an essentialized other whose identity, and this is a kind of key point, in this respect arrives from the other in inverted form. Now, does the savage fit such a nuanced image of how alterity operates in the construction of uh, dominant forms of identity? I think the answer is a mixed one. On the one hand, as I hope to detail below, the savage is in some sense the perfect other, the product of a matrix or even an accumulation of negations. He is exactly what we are not, especially in a lot of these uh, colonial texts. On the other hand, largely because this negation is very formal, at times very one-dimensional, the savage is rarely, if at all, in a lot of these texts from the mid-16th to the 18th century, though I will go through some of the exceptions, the occasion for a limit experience or an uncanny encounter of the kind that the likes of Foucault talked about in terms of madness. It seems to serve at best as the locus of an ironic reversal and skepticism about the vaunted values and virtues of the civilized a sort of ironic mirror, so to speak, but not necessarily a particularly uh, nuanced one. No doubt this is also an effect of the reliance of this philosophical literature on missionary literature, the writings especially of Jesuit priests, for instance, already steeped in classical and Christian images of otherness rather than on the actual encounters between settlers and First Nations. The figure of the savage in this regard has been seen by a lot of scholars uh, of this issue as a product of what they call comparative negation. The Italian historian Sergio Landucci, uh, who wrote a landmark book called The Philosopher and the Savages, unfortunately still untranslated into English, starts his periodization of philosophy's invention of the savage with um, Michel de Montaigne's very famous short essay 
of the cannibals or on the cannibals, depending on the translation. Uh, this is a, a text which, in John Florio's early 17th century translation, includes the following um, famous lines referring to the native populations encountered by French colonists and missionaries in Brazil, or what they called Antarctic France. Yeah, indeed. Um, it is a nation, would I answer Plato, he's of course referring to the Republic, that hath no kind of traffic, no knowledge of letters, no intelligence of numbers, no name of magistrate, nor of political superiority, no use of service or riches or of poverty, no contracts, no successions, no dividends, no occupations but idle, no respect of kindred but common, no apparel but natural, no manuring of lands, no use of wine, corn, or metal. That uh, uh, engraving by um, uh, Théodore de Brie, which uh, some of whose other engravings I'll turn to uh, later, is from one of the uh, accounts um, uh, this you know, sort of absurd mise-en-scene of uh, the supposed acts of cannibalism as a kind of collective barbecue uh, bearing no ethnographic <laughs> uh, uh, um, verity, nevertheless, is, what is, from, is based on one of the travel accounts that Montaigne had uh, also used. Now, in Montaigne, this logic of negation or privation or lack was intended to frame the radical diversity he identified as part of human nature as a, at a more philosophical level, and skeptically to puncture the superior pride of the so-called civilized. He meant to use the account of the cannibal to relativize the very category of barbarism, which is one of the categories that accompanies in quite complex ways the category of the savage throughout this history, and by proposing that the savage's greater closeness to nature condemned the bastardizing effects of our artificial customs, one of the reasons why he's been linked also to various mythologies of uh, the golden age that projected themselves onto this figure of the savage. Montaigne would then fill in the framework of otherness or difference by negation with descriptions of forms of life, especially activities of warfare and indeed of anthropophagy or cannibalism itself, which were incommensurable enough with those of his uh, contemporaries in France to undermine dominant doctrines of his time that defined something like a universalizing political anthropology. So part of the skeptical position and the reason why he's been seen, including by the likes of Claude de Vissaus as a precursor of variants of cultural relativism, was an attack on forms of uh, uh, um, medieval and Renaissance conceptions of a human universality. Above all, the Christian idea of the consensus uh, gentium, of the, of the agreement of uh, the peoples, and Aristotle's vision of man as a political animal. So in some sense, that was, those are some of the universalizing tropes that the figure of the cannibal was meant to undo. Though the uses and effects of Montaigne's savage, in which negation and difference heralded a skeptical and ironic suspension of Europe's divisive confidence in its own superiority, were of a kind, sui generis, his effort at a dispassionate description of indigenous life was perhaps unique. The logic of comparative negation, so all of these, you know, no kind of traffic, no magistrate, etc., was immensely common across this period. So this, just to reiterate, even though it's a very significant variant of it, is not in any way unique to Montaigne. In fact, it's the aspect of on cannibals which he shares with most thinkers. So just to give you a couple of examples, but they are really legion. In one of the very first travel narratives from the New World, um, a famous letter to his patron, Lorenzo de' Medici, the Florentine navigator Amerigo Vespucci, the one after whom the continent, continents was, uh, were named, um, not by himself, by, by the cartographer Mercator in 1530. Uh, this is what Vespucci uh, declared. So this is a letter from the early 1500s. They have no cloth either of wool, linen, or cotton, since they need it not. Neither do they have goods of their own, but all things are held in common. They live together without king, without government, and each is his own master. They marry as many wives as they please, etc., etc., etc. Then beyond the fact that they have no church, no religion, and are not idolaters, what more can I say? They live according to nature, secundum nature, and may be called your Epicureans rather than Stoics. This shows in part also how relentless the uh, ancient Greek reference was for all of these uh, uh, debates. There are no merchants among their number, nor there is barter. The nations wage war upon one another without art or order. 
In 1505, a version of Vespucci's uh, own comparative negation would capture one of the first visual representations of Amer Amerindian peoples in Europe. So this is the 1505 um, engraving. Columbus, writing in 1493, announcing his discovery in another famous letter, spoke of the natives of uh, Hispaniola as having no iron and steel, nor any weapons, nor are they fit thereunto. In 1511, um, Peter Martyr d'Angeria, in another landmark text for the European perception of indigenous peoples of the Americas, would write in similar terms, beginning the letter again with this, what turns out to be a kind of peculiarly utopian uh, trope, perhaps despite itself, land is as common as the sun and water, mine and thine, the seeds of all mischief have no place with them. So this also belongs again to this kind of resonance of a golden age uh, figure. As Margaret Hodgen has shown, citing these and other examples from the early 16th um, century, passages such as this formed what she calls conventionalized statements not unique to any one author or particularly philosophical in orientation. The barbarous or savage other was defined by the privation, the lack of the innumerable elements of Western civilization, law, property, sovereign power, the mechanical arts, agriculture, mathematics, writing, commerce, money, and so on. This particular convention, the negative itemizing of difference is nigh on ubiquitous from the 16th century onwards and can be registered across travelers' chronicles in Enlightenment encyclopedias and dictionaries and from Kant's anthropology to Darwin's voyages. But there's also nothing particularly modern about this ethnocentric logic of contrast with the other who only exists as an absence or negative of the self. One can encounter it in the 12th century old French Roman d'Alexandre where the Indian Brahmin were described as having no agriculture, no iron, no building, no fire, no bread, no wine, no clothing, etc but also in ancient Roman and Greek accounts of the nomadic Scythians. And it's also uncanny how much in these uh, uh, colonial travel narratives, etc., there is just a kind of quotation or mapping of these classical figures of barbarism or otherness onto uh, uh, the Amerindian populations. So Strabo in the first century BC writes about Scythians as knowing nothing about the storing of food or about the peddling of merchandise either, etc. So this monotony of comparative negation is no surprise if we reflect on the extent to which Renaissance and early modern thinkers cognize the world through frameworks compounded from ancient Roman and Greek traditions and their biblical hybrids. The New World Savage is always haunted by ancient utopias of golden ages or alternatively by classical figures of barbarism or at times by both. As Hayden White has suggested in his, suggest in his study of the forms of wildness, what he calls the forms of wildness that preceded the emergence of the colonial and modern figure of the savage. What we are dealing with in this pattern is what he calls a technique of ostensive self-definition by negation, or what he calls the creation of antitypes. So the savage would be precisely one of these antitypes in a particularly potent one. From a certain angle, the modern savage could be seen as the illusory realization of the fantastical figure very present across uh, European cultures in the pre-colonial period of the wild man, which had um, menaced and enlivened the real and psychic margins of European cultures in antiquity and the Middle Ages. And of course, here one could enter into a whole debate in, about the ways in which uh, uh, imaginaries, fantasies, and cultural tropes internal to the experience uh, uh, of European cultures, including their own internal forms of racialization preempted, preceded, and were projected onto uh, um, the colony. So, uh, which also, in many ways, uh, dulls the extent to which one thinks that the encounter with otherness, etc., was what uh, uh, produced these figures of uh, uh, savagery. So, did anything uncanny remain in the formalization, projection, and spatialization of the pre-colonial Homo Selvaticus or wild man? onto the native peoples of the Americas, anything that would confront a colonizing rationality with the experience of its limits. So in a sense, I just want to continue to see to what extent there are points at which the figure of the savage somehow causes the kind of unsettling uncanniness and disturbance that someone like uh, 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 Balabar mentioned in the quote uh, before. Now, we might be tempted to single out the idea of the noble savage as such a limit, but such an identification would be mistaken. As a 
whole slew of scholars uh, have shown, uh, the noble savage is largely a retroactive ideological construction about the positions that people held in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. And in fact, uh, in a very interesting book by Ter Ellingson, it's uh, argued quite persuasively that it's in fact a late 19th century British imperial debate which creates the figure of the noble savage as a way of warning people against the supposed Rousseauian primitivism and instead uh, 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 supporting the virtues of uh, various uh, imperial uh, missions. Now, building a on a suggestion by another historian, Michel Duchet, we could further argue that to the extent that the reality of the savage world is trapped in a network of negations, uh, it is the very formalism of these negations, so the very kind of repetitious, not this, not that, uh, uh, which I've already gone through, which um, ironically opens them up to a quasi-structuralist play of combinations and inversions, as well as the emergence of a kind of set of negative utopias, you know, no mine, no thine, uh, no commerce, no money, and so on and so forth. As I will suggest in a moment, I think it also matters to the historical mutation in the figure of the savage which negations take precedence. So I think it's very significant once one turns to how the figure of the savage is used, especially by modern political philosophers, uh, Hobbes and Locke above all. What is the order? What is the precedence? Uh, what matters most? Not property? not money, uh, not religion, etc. Is the savage primarily the human without property or in the positive vein with common possessions, without religion or with non-monotheistic spiritual practices, without government or with equality, without industriousness or with freedom, and in the sense that every negation can be shadowed by some positive figure. So the negation of property, for instance, by that of the commons. As concerns utopia instead, in moments of cultural, political, and economic crisis, we could see the anti-type as becoming potentially a positive type, even we could add a kind of prototype. Rather than a positive valuation of indigenous Amerindian societies, though this is not wholly absent, for instance, in the writings of certain missionaries, the nobility in the sense of affirmative value of the savage lies in its negativity. By now, I imagine especially with those various quotes, some of you may have already heard echoing in these litanies of comparative negation, Auguste Blanqui's famous libertarian communist slogan, ni dieu ni maître, no gods, no masters, which literally appears in a number of these quotes already in the 16th century. Now this negative dialectic of savage dystopia and colonial utopia is present in what is perhaps the most well-known literary instantiation of the savage as the comparative negation of the civilized. This is Gonzalo's evocation in Act 2, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's The Tempest of the anti-political commonwealth that he would impose had he the chance on Prospero's island. In the commonwealth, I would by contraries execute all things, for no kind of traffic would I admit, no name of magistrate, letter should not be known, richest poverty and use of service, none, contract succession, born, bond of land, tilth, vineyard, none, no use of metal, corn or wine or oil, <coughs> No occupation, all men idle, all, and women too, but innocent and pure, no sovereignty. All things in common nature should produce, without sweat or endeavor, treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun, or need of any engine would I not have, but nature should bring forth of its own kind, all foison, all abundance, to feed my innocent people. Now, as Shakespeare scholars began to notice in the late 18th century and continue to discuss to this day, the speech is just a kind of plagiarism or detournement of Montaigne's uh, of Cannibals, uh, which Shakespeare had read in this John Florio translation. Um, of course, as Hodgen has uh, uh, argued, uh, if it is indeed the case, as it very much seems to be that Shakespeare took this from Montaigne, then Shakespeare borrowed from the least original, most conventional of Montaigne's musings on the philosophical lessons of Brazilian cannibalism. What is perhaps more telling, and perhaps more critically interesting in uh, Shakespeare, is that this is a European's utopia, of the island as a kind of tabula rasa, where one may elide or invert civilization and its discontents not a description of the so-called natives who receive in the figure of Caliban a much more pejorative but also much more unsettling and interesting image. We are in the presence here perhaps of a kind of secondary or imaginary colonization, the one that projects onto savage colonized lands, spatializing it, a European desire for the negation of one's own civilization. 
a desire which, as Hayden White suggests, inverts the valence of the antitype in moments of cultural crisis. Shakespeare, and this is also the brilliance of this whole passage, in some sense punctures the certainties of this colonial utopian imagination with the interjection of the other figure, uh, uh, Antonio's realpolitik moment, when he says to Gonzalo after he's enumerated this uh, 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 you know, fantasy of the commons, the latter end of his commonwealth forgets the beginning. Gonzalo's withering of a way of the state in the colonies forgets the birth of his commonwealth, the clearing of his commonwealth, uh, that it is a fact of treason, felony, sword, pike, knife, gun. Now, when the Martinican anti-colonial poet and politician Aimé Césaire adapted Shakespeare's play in his own A Tempest in 1969, the words he put in Gonzalo's mouth also spoke to the limits of his negative and primitivist colonial utopia. <laughs> this is Gonzalo in Césaire. I mean that if the island is inhabited, as I believe, and if we colonize it, as is my hope, then we have to take every precaution not to import our shortcomings, yes, what we call civilization. They must stay as they are, savages, noble, and good savages, free, without any complexes or complications. Something like a pool granting eternal youth where we periodically come to restore our aging, citified souls. A very corrosive <laughs> reading of the, of, of the already pretty uh, uh, salient subtext in Shakespeare as well. Now, I haven't forgotten about philosophy or its history, and it seems fitting now to turn to the most fiercely anti-utopian of modern philosophers, Thomas Hobbes who's a crucial author in a number of these histories of the relationship between philosophy and uh, the figure of the savage, especially the work of the Italian historian Landucci. With Hobbes, we can briefly explore how, explore how notwithstanding the seemingly transhistorical immobility, invariance, portability of the savage as this kind of antitype, what seem to be the same kind of negations can be the bearers of very different philosophical contents and projects. So four decades after Shakespeare's Tempest, Hobbes' Leviathan depicted the state of nature in the following very well-known terms. So the first half of the quotation. During the time, men live without a common power to keep them all in awe. They are in a condition which is called war. In such condition, there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation or use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is the worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Now, modern political philosophy is arguably born of this matrix of negations, juxtaposing an imaginary that is both formalistic and terrifying in its idea of pure privation. In the state of nature, uh, a privation that leads to the imperative necessity of the state, what Hobbes famously called that artificial man. Though Hobbes, who was personally involved in the colonial enterprise as a stockholder of the Virginia Company, and uh, here depicted uh, 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 massacre in um, uh, Jamestown was in, in 1621 was arguably one of the haunting images of uh, uh, a war that also accompanied him. Um, Hobbes spoke of what he called the savages of America sparingly, again, notwithstanding his commercial participations, but he did so at crucial points in his over. And the role of ethnological accounts of North American forms of life in shoring up or verifying Hobbes's political anthropology should not be underestimated. Uh, homo homini lupus est, man is a wolf to man, was after all an expression that apparently was first used in a colonial travel narrative. Two paragraphs after the very famous and very widely quoted formulation, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, and anticipating the response of a skeptical reader who would think this is just a kind of philosophical thought experiment or fancy, Hobbes notes the following, from which the second bit of the quote is taken. It may peradventure be thought that there was never such a time nor condition of war as this. And I believe it was never generally so over all the world, but there are many places where they live so now. And that's not an insignificant moment. For the savage people in many places of America, 
And when, when he says in many places of America, it's also parenthetically interesting that there's a whole elaborate debate about the problems faced by philosophers, proto-ethnologists, missionaries, etc., in differentiating between the so-called savages, i.e. Uh, Amerindian people without uh, vis visibly state-like structures of power, and the uh, uh, Inca or the Aztec, which were often put in an entirely different uh, category. So he says, for the savage people in many places of America, except the government of small families, the conquered were of dependence on natural lust, have no government at all, and live at this day in that brutish manner, as I said before. Howsoever it may be perceived what manner of life there would be, were there no common power to fear, by the manner of life which men that have formerly lived under a peaceful government used to degenerate into civil wars. So it's contemporary civil wars and the uh, uh, condition of the so-called savages of America as a kind of evidence for what is otherwise uh, seemingly deductive or quasi kind of transcendental argument. Now, a number of elements of Hobbes's usage of the savage antitype are worth pausing on. The first is that while Hobbes firmly rejects Aristotle's political anthropology and psychology, so a psychology in which man was a political animal, in which uh, being in a society and being in a city, uh, uh, being in a civic space, were uh, 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 convertible to one another, uh, he rejects this especially by affirming the thoroughly artificial character of politics. So there's, no, there's not a human teleology towards the political in the same way that Aristotelians, including in his own time, would have thought. Uh, this also means that he removes all of the bases uh, very significant to um, justifications by certain theologians of the Spanish conquest that the Amerindian people were natural slaves, that they were somehow anthropologically and psychologically lacking and therefore demanding uh, 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 some kind of slavery or rule. Uh, but what he does do in this artificial vein is affirm an identity between social life and life under a state, not in the natural sense, but in the artificial sense. So there's both a rejection of Aristotle in a very different vein, which marks out Hobbes's modernity, an identification of social life, which involves industry and property and commerce, etc., with the need to have life under a state. The state, like property itself, is a thoroughly artificial institution, whereas if we can speak of a natural state among human beings, this will be a kind of state of civil war. Though he certainly situated the savage on an inferior rung in the hierarchy of what he called the civilized arts, Hobbes, like his 17th century rationalist contemporaries, could be seen to maintain an ultimately homogeneous and paradoxically egalitarian philosophical anthropology. Social and political difference for Hobbes were necessary and salutary, but they were not natural. This also involved, this is also very interesting to th think, in fact, that, you know, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, racist statements easily found in the likes of David Hume or indeed Voltaire are completely absent from uh, the cognitive space of the likes of Descartes and Hobbes, which is not an insignificant uh, uh, realization. Now, this also involved positing that in the contemporary savage condition, one could read the past of European countries themselves. This is the perception of the other as allochronic, living in another or previous time, and in a space other than time, which uh, Johannes Fabian juxtaposed to the notion of non-Western cultures as coeval, which he saw as part of a, of a different anthropological gaze. Um, it is a view that's painfully uh, manifest in all of those anthropological visions of the savage as a kind of living fossil. This is what Pierre Claster identifies and as what he calls the ancient Western conviction that history is a one-way street, the societies without power are the image of what we have ceased to be, and that for them our culture is the image of what they have to become. Now this theme of the savage as the past and the present, so to speak, later crystallized in John Locke's famous dictum, in the beginning, the whole world was America, makes an important appearance in Hobbes himself in 1642 in The Elements of Law, where he writes of, quote, the experience of savage nations that live at this day and by the history of our ancestors. So this is a kind of short circuit. This interjection of the savagery projected into the Americans into Europe is also present in the iconography uh, and in the, in, in the uh, uh, frontispieces that accompanied uh, Hobbes's work. So for instance, 
Hobbes's De Chive, which quotes um, uh, the engravings by Theodore de Brie of a book on the conquest of Virginia. So you can see here the figures of uh, uh, Imperium and Libertas. Behind Libertas you see humans hunting humans. This is exactly the uh, image that's taken from the same kind of image at the back of Theodore de Brie's uh, um, accounts of uh, uh, Virginia, which again is the place where uh, Hobbes had his own um, colonial interests. The visual juxtaposition of the sovereign um, imperium on the left and its accoutrements of production, science, security, farming, etc., and savage libertas on the right could not be a pithier counterpart to the practice of comparative negation. You know, the, the, the savages on the right, the civilized on the left. At the same time, however, it indicates the openly repressed utopian dimension of modern political philosophy, which in Hobbes, but also quite explicitly in Locke and Adam Smith after him, recognizes that the security, order, and production are gained at the cost of freedom. Freedom is, in a sense, what needs to be sacrificed for a production to exist, or at least a certain type of freedom. The iconography also shows us how much the imagination of the Americas was steeped in a classical visual and political culture, which, one which, in the case of Debris Compendium, made graphic the link between New World and Old World savagery. So, for instance, Debris uh, uh, accompanied his uh, uh, plates on Virginia with plates supposedly depicting the savage state of the earlier inhabitants of the British Isles, the Picts. So this is again how the, the notion is that there is this sort of short circuit between the uh, new world space of savagery and the savage past of, uh, and the racialized savage past of Europe uh, itself. Attention to Hobbes' own use of the savage antitype instructs us that rather than representing an ethnocentric invariant across Western history, it shifted in historically significant ways, and that these shifts were articulated, at least in part, in terms of what we could call a hierarchy of negations. In other words, Hobbes' list largely seems to match those of Montaigne, and indeed seems to echo those ancient and medieval cases I mentioned. But in it, one negation reigns supreme, the negation of the state. It is from this, or rather, not necessarily from its negation, from its absence or lack, that from the savage absence of sovereign government that everything else follows. The absence of laws, of property, of security, of agricultural development, of productive labor, of the arts, and so on. Contrast the dislocation of this hierarchy by Locke, for whom it is the absence of property and land and the division of labor attendant thereto, which is the dominant negation from which the others, including especially that of government, follow. So there's a complete uh, uh, difference in this order of negation, which has massive uh, influence on questions of political philosophy. This recombination of comparative negation from the problem of political order or security in Hobbes to that of productive development and property in Locke will be crucial in opening the way for what some historians, including uh, uh, Landucci and indeed Anthony Pagden, see as a move of the philosophical figure of the savage beyond this kind of moral, axiomatic, comparative negation, um, which can go from you know, dystopia to romanticism, towards the placing of the savage within a historical and materialist problematic of social development. So in some sense, at least according to some of these histories, it is moving away from Hobbes's primacy of the state towards uh, a way of thinking made possible by the primacy of property in Locke and then of ways of living or means of subsistence in Montesquieu that uh, uh, um, and the 18th century, the late 18th century, the Enlightenment and classical political economy can start to develop this kind of stagist conception of social development in which means of subsistence serve as a basis on which the superstructure of laws, states, property, government, the arts and religion reside. Um, this is the paradigm that will be fundamental to the development of classical political economy and its uh, philosophical anthropology, above all in the work of the Scottish Enlightenment, from William Robertson's History of America to Adam Smith's writings on law, history, and economics. Now, for historians like Landucci and in English, uh, Roland, uh, Ronald Meek, in his uh, famous book, Social Science and the Ignoble Savage, which in a sense presents the Scottish Enlightenment as a kind of uh, 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 rather virtuous precursor of Marxism, uh, 
Uh, for such historians, notwithstanding all of its shortcomings, this bourgeois social science um, of development will mark a crucial step between the formalism, b beyond the formalism of the civilized and the barbarous, in the direction of a kind of positive knowledge of social and cultural change and conflict. This progressive history, in which the Scottish Enlightenment is Marxism's scientific precursor, has to incorporate, to my mind, a little too quickly and a little too smoothly, the acknowledged fact that modern racism is a key function of the shift from a rationalist to a socio-historical conception of the savage. But it must also, to my mind, underplay, as I believe someone like Landucci does, the way in which the framework of negation is transmuted but not abandoned in these kind of ethnological and anthropological writings that accompany Scottish Enlightenment notions of development. This is manifest, above all, in the endurance of the Lockean axiom, that from the absence or lack of property, there derive all of the other absences, lacks, and lags that pertain to the savage condition. And it is demonstrated in the extremely selective way in which the writers of the Scottish Enlightenment kind of assimilated and edited the travel narratives of Jesuit missionaries in North America to minimize their agricultural practices, for instance, which didn't really fit into the stage's history, to marginalize the record of collective political deliberation in order to argue that they hadn't developed particularly elaborate state forms. If we abandon the prejudice whereby historicism, even if laced with the property ideologies of racial capitalism, is to be preferred to rationalism a la Hobbes uh, or skepticism a la Montaigne, if only as a precursor of Marxism, um, we can nevertheless draw, I think, an important lesson from these studies of the figure of the savage, and especially from Landucci's The Philosopher and the Savages, where he identifies the key turning point in the history of European philosophy's conceptualization of the savage in the thesis, and this is, I think, key, that there can be societies without a state. So this is for uh, uh, Landucci a kind of moment of cognitive and philosophical discovery, especially in the 18th century engagement with uh, North American, uh, um, uh, uh, North American uh, indigenous uh, peoples. The sharpest statement of this anti-Hobbesian argument, which seeks to counter an identification of social life with governed life established in Europe from Aristotle onwards, is to be found in a text from Leibniz from 1711. Uh, Leibniz is responding to these very peculiar uh, writings of a uh, French uh, soldier of uh, fortune, Baron de la Hontane, especially this uh, fictionalized dialogue uh, with, uh, 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 with um, uh, an indigenous uh, uh, philosopher. Um, and this is what Leibniz uh, writes. The Iroquois and the Huron have reversed the excessively universal political maxims of Aristotle and Hobbes. They have shown that entire peoples can live without magistrates and without quarrels, but the rudeness of the savages shows that it is not so much necessity but the inclination to go towards the good and approach happiness by mutual assistance that is the foundation of societies and states. A year earlier, in a letter also engaging with his reading of Lantan, Leibniz had subverted the logic of comparative negation even more thoroughly, writing that, it is entirely truthful that the Americans of these regions live together without any government but in peace they know no fights, nor hatreds, nor battles, or not many, except against men of different nations and languages. I would say, almost say that we are dealing with a political miracle unknown by Aristotle and ignored by Hobbes. So to conclude, whatever the truthfulness of such claims, which of course were also staked on a largely entirely fictional text like the one of Baron de la Hontan, it is striking that Leibniz's mention of a political miracle opens up a possibility very distant from most European and philosophical responses to the encounter with the indigenous populations of the Americas. Namely, that rather than a negation of Europe and its notions of the political, a negation that may be utopian or subversive, but which is entirely drawn from within an imaginary repertoire uh, of Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian sources, that perhaps the encounter with North American societies may have required a different and unprecedented thinking of politics. As many commentators have detailed, the colonial encounter with the indigenous population of the Americas was one marked in the intellectual sphere by the assimilation to models, myths, conceptual imaginaries, and formal taxonomies that populated the European mind in that period. An encounter in which comparativism was laced with the violence of an imperialist instrumental rationality. In this sense, the idea of the savage largely served as a screen in that regard. <clears throat> 
Very rarely was there a sense, as in Leibniz's political miracle, that the people of the Americas could force Europe to dislocate, to expatriate its legal, political, or economic philosophies. In a sense, European intellectual life would have to wait until the second half of the 20th century for the emergence of radical trends in anthropology to unfold the kind of miracle whereof Leibniz spoke. And to conclude with this, uh, Pierre Clastres' Society Against the State, for instance, could be read as an extended elaboration of the anti-Aristotelian and anti-Hobbesian effects of the encounter with Amerindian people first glimpsed by Leibniz. From his field works among the Guayaki Indians in Paraguay, as in the evidence of so much anthropological work across the Americas, Clastres would draw a drastic challenge to the anthropology of the West, namely in the ubiquity in both North and South America of societies where political power was not or indeed politics, was not synonymous with the dialectic of obedience and command, with the monopolization of violence and the separation of a political sphere. Clastra would even go so far as portraying Amerindian forms of chiefdom as collective strategies to prevent the emergence of politics as sovereign domination. As he commented, one is confronted then by a vast constellation of societies in which the holders of what elsewhere would be called power are actually without power, where the political is determined as a domain beyond coercion and violence, beyond hierarchical subordination, where, in a word, no relationship of command obedience is in force. This is a major difference of the Indian world. And I'll stop here so we can open it up for questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Um, we're now going to um, have about five minutes of um, commentary and response from um, Dr. Subir Sinha. For those of you who don't know him, um, Subir is a senior lecturer in the Department of Development Studies with um, research expertise, among other things, in institutional change, social movements, state society relations, and South Asian politics. Where is everyone going? I thought you were here to listen to my response to the scandal. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, there's more air for us to breathe, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Alberto. That was a really fantastic one, talk. One, one minute, so you yeah, can settle down. Yeah. So those who, yep. they can hear you. <laughs> yeah. I think we're good now. Okay, I'm not quite sure how that happened, but loads of people left, and yet we still have a full lecture theatre. <laughs> so, um, over to Subir. Well, thanks very much, Alberto. Really excellent talk. Uh, I think some of you might, who are taking courses in development studies, found some things in common with what we've been talking about in the last two or three weeks. Um, I basically want to, you know, have three different uh, points that are sets of points that I'd like to make. You can hear me in the back, yes? Yeah, okay. Closer to the microphone, okay. Uh, the first one is, in a bizarre way, I was actually, you know, kind of uh, comforted to see that even the depictions of savages that you have, have a human form. In the sense that just uh, barely 200 years before some of the documents that you showed, if one looked at the Salter map or the Mapa Mundi, these two uh, famous maps of the 13th and 14th centuries, uh, the rest of the world was actually inhabited by monsters. You had uh, people who had faces in their chests but without a head whatsoever, or you were depicted, uh, you had depictions of other places outside of Europe where hybrids of uh, people with dog heads and human bodies, etc., used to reside. So, in a strange kind of way, it almost appears to me that these depictions are on the verge of granting humanity to the savage, which was not the case even a couple of hundred years before. And to me, that 
uh, you know, raises a certain set of questions which are along the following lines. Is the savage actually on a continuum from the monster to the human? Uh, and secondly, if that is the case, then is savaging an active process? The construction of and the making of and the taming of and the prescription of things to be done to the savage seems to be on a particular kind of continuum. And of course, uh, incipient in the text that you, and in fact explicit in some of the texts that you have shown, there is the justification for slavery and for colonization and for the formation of the state and, and the like. So uh, that, that I think is an interesting one, which is that you know, in, in, in some ways the depiction of the savage and the writings about them are uh, moments in time, if you like, of a longer historical process of converting monsters into human beings. The second element which is connected to that is that this, uh, if one was to look at a slightly different but contemporary uh, text, uh, and you know, I communicated with you earlier on that, and I have in mind particularly the writings of uh, theologians from the University of Salamanca in Portugal in the 16th century, uh, especially theologians uh, such as um, Federico uh, de Vitoria, and they basically make an, an interesting argument, which is that from the early 1500s, they are thinking of the savage as human. And in fact, they want to take certain elements of what they believe to be universalistic elements of theological philosophy, particularly that coming out of Thomas Aquinas, to try and see if they can expand that to include those who live in these lands. So uh, explicit writings on the application of just war theory to uh, resistance and defensive mechanisms of savages, uh, which I think is a kind of a universalizing move. Uh, second, the idea whether or not if someone was offered the chance to accept Christ as their Lord and Master in a language they did not recognize and then for them to be killed because they did not accept Christ, uh, there is a question regarding whether or not they have a life, uh, a right to life. And I think that is also quite interesting that it is coterminous with some of the writings which seem to be depicting them in ways that put them beyond the pale of universality and of a kind of a, an obstinate otherness which seems at this moment as being uh, almost impossible to erase. So to, there is a very exaggerated otherness, but at the same time there seems to be a desire to bring them within the domain of the universal, and I think there's a ni nice tension there uh, in, in, in this particular you know, uh, dimension. The second is that it is not just about the othering, it seems to me, but it is also about, uh, you know, commonsensically uh, creating a cate categorization and hierarchization of otherness. So you've got the lacks that you mentioned, and you know, I sort of was reminded of uh, Michael Ados's book from 1989, which is Machines as the Measure of Man, where he basically looks at how Europeans devised a classification of populations around the world based precisely on some of the lacks that you, that you have described. And in particular, the lacks that are of, of interest in that uh, classificatory scheme are whether or not they had the wheel, uh, whether they had writing, and particularly in the later phase, whether they had historical writing, which obviously you know, Hegel deals with, his, uh, with in his essay uh, on world history. So that is interesting to me, which is uh, within the other is a further othering kind of a process, and the savage seems to be one element on the spectrum of different other people. Uh, the third point I just want to make very briefly is that uh, you know, there's a Canadian theorist uh, called John Beasley Murray who uh, talks about the fact that a kind of a, you know, some of what you describe are the top philosophers of the time, but there is a, a classification of writing which is what uh, foot soldiers of the conquest carried with them, and they also had this sort of and perhaps more crude depictions of the other. And the point of these writings was to constantly affirm to those who were engaged in brutalizing the other that the other needed to be brutalized, that they were not pos it was not possible for them uh, beyond the point to be persuaded to accept Christ and civilization and so that they should be you know, killed. But as we know about Latin America particularly, not so much America, large-scale mixing of the races happened and over a few hundred years obviously uh, 
most of Latin America became mixed race of some sort or another. Uh, particularly if you look at mestizo populations within Mexico and in Central America. So how do you sort of account for this massive difference and the production of it in these kinds of texts and the real life encounters which on the one hand had that kind of brutal violence and genocidal violence but also resulted in intermingling and so on. And on the question of intermingling I'll just make a last point which is that um, you know, if you think of some of the attributes of the savage, they are not entirely distinct from the attributes to, you know, given to the poor within Europe. Mm -hmm. And in particular, if you think in terms of the lacks which are being described here, uh, and poor and its cognate words in a range of medieval uh, usages across Europe, uh, also talks about dispossession. They don't have this, they don't have that, and so on. So there is already a template of otherness within Europe, which is then exaggerated and projected outside of Europe, and the lack element of that, obviously, uh, is, is extremely interesting and important there. Now, the possibilities for there to be anything like a political association across these different racial and continental divisions is what Peter Leinbaum perhaps talks about in the multi-headed hydra, where he looks at exactly these different classifications of people. And in fact, he, he refers explicitly to how the uh, sort of Amerindian experiences, uh, for example, people who might have worked on slave ships with Irish sailors or pirates or black people from Africa, there is a possibility of having a different kind of political association, which is not covered by Hobbes, and it is not covered by any of the other political utopian or anti-utopians who are talking about what next sort of scenario. And it seems to me that the uh, insistence on culture and civilization as that which divides Europe from the savage, in some ways papers over that other possibility of the poor of Europe <coughs> having some degree of solidarity with that mm -hmm. of the colonized population. Mm -hmm. So I'll just leave for you to think about and talk to us about that. No, that's great. Thanks so much. And um, I'll just try to be brief uh, uh, to what are questions that require anything but brevity to answer properly. So first, with the, the last point, um, the question of, of the poor, or indeed, I think even of the, of the peasantry, if I'm not mistaken, uh, emerges explicitly in those theological debates in, in Salamanca that Vittoria is, is involved in, because partly what's being discussed is the whole question of, of uh, natural slavery as a model through which to justify the potential enslavement of uh, indigenous peoples in the Americas, which interestingly is something that is being pushed by some of the conquistadors and which in fact at a certain point the Spanish state, not out of benevolence, but just doesn't find to be particularly um, uh, uh, attractive because they actually want to produce populations from which they can draw tribute. That case, so in the discussion, there's a sense of, well, you know, since our, you know, part of the argument against natural slavery is to say, well, we don't treat our peasants Aristotel as Aristotelian natural slaves. We just treat them as inferior or worthy of command, etc., but not as anthropologically lacking in that quite extreme sense that natural slavery involves, which according to Vitali is not compatible with a kind of Christian uh, sort of uh, anthropology. And there it's interesting that you do have that in, in the move from the idea of natural slavery to, um, to uh, the position that Vitali brings forward, which is, you know, shouldn't be exactly represented as enlightened because it's a shift within Aristotle from the natural slave to the child. So basically then the indigenous population is fully human, but only potentially so. This justifies command, but doesn't, and justifies even indenture, but doesn't justify slavery ad infinitum because, you know, they are kind of ultimately human. But I think those short circuits are also short circuits that fascinatingly follow in a, you know, in a more kind of popular cultural sense uh, all the way into the 19th century. So if you read something like Walter Benjamin's Arcade's project, uh, the narratives of uh, Parisian class conflict are full of language, of savages, of, and, the, and then mappings onto you know, these very stereotypical imaginaries of the Apaches and the Sioux and so on. So that ends up being also a language through which 
European class and social conflicts get mapped in, in, in curious ways. Of course, ways that totally occlude uh, uh, almost invariably the kind of solidarities identified by the likes of Redeker and Leinbau that, that, that you were um, talking about. One of the things that, that talking about the, the, the philosophical uh, history of the figure of the savage also occludes, and, and, and partly it's because I was dealing mainly with texts by Landucci and Pagden rather than others. Uh, there's a brilliant text by an Italian historian, also from the 70s, uh, also a Marxist like Landucci was back then, uh, Giuliano Liozzi, who writes this whole text about the role that biblical narratives had uh, in justifying title to uh, um, uh, lands in the Americas. And, and one of the things that he shows is that something which is very difficult to make any sense out of, which is basically the creation of all of these fantastic genealogies whereby, you know, the population of Peru were, you know, related to Norwegians, you know, all of these bizarre narratives, which seem to be just the, the, the product of, of some, uh, 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 you know, kind of surrealist principle within, you know, European colonialism, or just a result of really technical legal debates, which required the Spanish claim to be countered by others, including, uh, 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 including the, the, the British or the Dutch or the Swedes or whatever, by different languages of legitimacy, which involved title, which therefore involved using the languages of biblical narratives of the flood, all of these questions, you know, was there a new Adam? Did, did Christ somehow, uh, 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 did Christ somehow um, preach the gospel in the Americas before the arrival of the colonists, because then these are heathens, uh, or perhaps they're also Jews. There's all tons of writings about the potentially Jewish character of the Amerindian population. All of this makes no sense unless you actually see the, the colonial relation as one that's also based on these forms of legal justification. That also means that things that initially seem to be progressive can be anything but. So, for instance, the, 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 some of the more, uh, uh, you know, brutally instrumental uh, of, the, uh, of the conquistadors were the ones who were arguing against the Spanish crown that the societies of the so-called savages were fully political societies and not some kind of lower barbarism because they were claiming that Montezuma had given them title and that he could only give them title legally if he had title to give, which means that he had to be a sovereign, which means that they had to be a properly constituted political society. So this is also something that comes along with these narratives about human about, uh, humanity and so on. That's one of the ironies. I think we, we, um, we take it for granted, and understandably so, that, re that the recognition of humanity uh, is uh, a, a, a necessary condition you know, for, form, for you know, emancipated, if not egalitarian or yeah. you know, tolerable relations. It, it, it might be necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. It's sometimes it serves you know, the other, a quite contrary purpose as well. In this case, especially through this Aristotelian language of potentiality, so the somebody who's somebody who's fully human but only potentially so, justifies all sorts of extremely protracted uh, uh, forms of uh, 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 subjugation. So Vittoria, for instance, calculated that you know you needed something like you know, after having argued against natural slavery, you needed something like 600 years for full habituation to political society. So we're still in that um, period. Um, and uh, yes, I think th those, I mean, some of the main um, uh, uh, points that I, uh, that I wanted to raise. I mean, about the iconography, that also is interesting because you could argue that the depth, the depth of certain models which functioned as filters or screens through which to experience this reality, including the visual vocabulary of, of classical uh, 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 painting and, and, and sculpture, or Christian notions and Aristotelian notions of anthropology, actually made over, in a sense, over familiarizing encounter and kind of stopped the, 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 the figure of the of the monster, and actually, in some sense, again, make for the uncanny fact that the that the, the, more, the more brutal, the more ontological forms of difference actually came later. So it was actually after the likes of Montaigne or indeed even Hobbes, etc., that uh, thinkers in the, you know, in the 17th century into the 18th started proposing, again for these ideological reasons, the whole theory of polygenesis, that basically, contrary to what all Christian 
thinkers had to think, which was that there was only one source yeah. and that was Adam, that actually there were different sources and races were different species. So that's a much later conception, which is kind of ironic because we tend to think of yeah. the monster to yeah. equal as a kind of linear yeah, sure. tale, I guess. Yeah, thanks, Thank you very much to both of you for that discussion. Um, we now have about 25 minutes for questions, so I would like to open it up to the floor. If you just put your hand up. Right, if you, for anyone who has questions, uh, please just put your hand up um, really obviously. <laughs> Hi. Um, hello. So in terms of like depicting the savage as a comparative notion of the European self, does that still have any relevance in the kind of like modern discourse of, you know, third world populations or uh, just any non-European populations? Uh, good evening, Alberto. Thank you very much for an incredibly granular and um, a very sophisticated analysis. Sorry, can I just ask you to hold the microphone really close so we can hear? Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to Alberto for giving us a very granular and very sophisticated analysis. I just want to um, apologize for the, um, the exit of so many people. Uh, that would never happen at my university. Uh, my question is actually from the point of view of Australian legal history, where a lot of analysis has been done on Lockean notions of agriculture and enclosure, but no one as yet has made this explicit link that you delineate between the difference of hierarchies that Hobbes posits and that that Locke does. And I just wanted to ask you, have you looked very closely at some of the early images of indigenous Australians that came to Europe? Because in that, I think, is another chapter of a book for you, um, which may also bring the development studies people at SOAS up to date with um, the very cogent um, and incredibly sophisticated state apparatus that dispossesses indigenous people now. Thank you. So we had one over here, and then I think there was one here. So. Yes, uh, you mentioned disagreements among the colonizers about enslaving the indigenous people, disagreements about whether it is morally right, disagreements about whether it is economically sensible or beneficial to the colonizers, and so on. In my understanding, in addition to those arguments, there was the problem that, in general, the indigenous people refused to be enslaved. So I wonder, how was that refracted through different versions of the savage? Thank you. Did we have one more from yeah, here? Do you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. You seem to have your hand up. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, have you engaged much with like Afro pessimism? Because they've also done like a kind of genealogy of looking how both the savage is constructed and the race, and like, like you know, a modern ontological current world that they kind of 
Mm, it seems like predominant on the idea that there is an absence that can never be overcome through like the way in which reality is structured or not. You basically showed two types of negations or uh, negative na uh, narratives. Uh, one is uh, idealistic, um, so savage, free of money, etc., uh, where and we don't need to bring shortcomings of our civilization. And the other um, narrative where this and that and rightfulness and peace is absence, uh, absent and so on. Uh, so, which um, which is actually legitimize colonial, uh, colonialization chronologically? How did they live together, or one was dominant at one period time and then uh, was changed by another? And you what mean happened? Between the negative and the more. No, no, no. I mean two neg uh, two negative two negative narrations. Uh, one is more positive, idealistic. That uh, well, you showed the quotations. The, yeah. yeah. So and another, it was like more negative. That there is no rightfulness, there is no peace, there is okay. no that and this. Okay. Yeah. So and what happened to Savage? Uh, so uh, to, to these two accounts, when Savage was placed into historical and materialistic domain. I'm, context. I'm, I'm still a little having a little trouble identifying what you see as the two accounts, because you're saying they're both negative, but one is positive. I don't know. Uh, both negations. Yeah. That there is no this and that. Yeah. There is no money. There is yeah. no shortcomings of okay. our civilization. Yeah. Uh, the other one is uh, no peace, uh, no like law. Okay. No okay. this and that, yeah. and this why. Okay. Yeah. And what happens to them when they enter into a more... Yeah, yeah. How do they coexist? Do they... Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, I would just like to know, because the, what you've presented is a very... Um, is a version of uh, the savage coming from a Eurocentric standpoint. Is there any narrative in how the colonized saw so the European, so to speak? Did the colonized see them as savages as well? And if so, if, is there any similarities or differences? So if we, could, um, if we could perhaps answer this first round of questions, and then we can go for another set after that. Okay. I'll answer, I, I won't answer them necessarily in order, but just see what how it works. So I'll answer the, the, the last one uh, first, because it's easier to keep in mind. Um, so there are, um, sorry, uh, there, there are of course all sorts of different uh, accounts that one can find uh, that try either to, to reconstruct the, the encounter from the other side, of course always via records, you know, somewhat like um, you know, pro problems of, of, of subaltern studies, history, my, you know, reading, reading in the gaps, etc. but not entirely because, of course, in the case of, uh, especially as far as my understanding goes, especially in the case of the uh, uh, conquest and subjugation of the Inca Empire, there was very um, quickly, in fact, this goes back also to Sabir's point about the, 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 the mixing, partly because it was recognized as a hierarchical uh, society with uh, a priesthood, an aristocracy, a form of government, etc., which uh, and both in the case actually of the Inca and the, the, and the Aztec, there was a co-optation of the elite class into Spanish rule, also for reasons of, of, of quantity of personnel in short, uh, to the point that you know, uh, some Aztec cities were, were governed a, a hundred years after conquest by, you know, uh, uh, non-Spanish, you know, of course, in a, in a subsidiary vassalage kind of situation. So there were quite early on, uh, the names suddenly, you know, uh, at present escaped me, but there were writers who had been children uh, 
of uh, Inca, like, like, you know, uh, uh, an Inca aristocratic woman and a Spanish conquistador, for instance, who had direct linguistic and family and memory knowledge of what this meant for them. They were often, of course, or not often, they were all Christian converts and had to be in order to, to subsist in, in the situation, but they could tell that story. There's a really uh, great book, I think, a fascinating book by a, a French uh, historian called uh, Nathan Wachtel, um, who's translating into English, the name now escapes me, which is all about the experience of defeat, including the, the way in which that then threads itself into festivals and, 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 and holidays in, uh, in Peru and in Mexico to this day, where the experience, you know, where even though the population is a mixed population, it still celebrates or, or experiences that moment from, from the other side. The other text that I, I found recently is there's a, there's a really uh, uh, interesting, uh, huge interview um, called, I think, The Falling Sky, which is with a, a, um, a giant memoir uh, done by an anthropologist called Bruce Albert with a shaman from the, uh, um, a Tupinamba shaman, I think, uh, who, hmm? Yanomami. Yanomami, sorry. There you go, falling, falling sky, uh, which has a whole, uh, has a couple of chapters within the whole uh, account that directly talk about the, the experience and the imagination and also the cosmological insertion of the white man within their, you know, their own cosmology. So it's, it's not, you know, I, I think there are different accounts and one can, so it's not, it's not the situation where it's just some complete, you know, epistemological black hole where, you know, we only have access to things that, you know, a uh, Eurocentric uh, position had. Of course, there are mediations. I mean, you know, this is narrated to and published through uh, uh, an anthropologist, and it's not you know, a direct account, whatever that might be. But still, I think that, that, that can be found. Um, in terms of, well, in terms of these accounts that I talked about, I mean, I think, I think it is, I mean, uh, Subir, when he sent me some questions by email, was, was also asking about, you know, to what extent does this remain, for instance, not just within anthropological or developmental account, but within Marxism itself. And I think that's a very complicated uh, question. I mean, Klastra, who I was citing at, at, at the end, who was a virulent uh, anti-Marxist, or at least was a virulently anti the Marxist anthropologist of his time, we could argue about whether it, 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 he, was, he was that uh, uh, apt in his criticisms of Marx himself, but nevertheless saw the, 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 the figure, the developmental translation of the, of the savage as privation as a condition of possibility for uh, any uh, Marxist historical materialism. I mean, he says, I didn't, uh, the quote I had uh, uh, towards the end, he says, this is why Marxism as a theory, um, I didn't get to it, but you know, this is why Marxism as a theory of history founded on the tendency of the development of productive forces must give itself as a starting point a sort of degree zero of productive forces. And then he criticizes that by saying actually the notion that uh, so-called savages had economies of scarcity is a nonsense and Marshall Salins has proved otherwise, et cetera, et cetera. But it's interesting in that form degree zero that there is the, there is the sense of the transcoding uh, of, a, of a lack. Um, in that uh, uh, regard, though, from the other side, there's a quite interesting debate that uh, Claude Levi-Strauss has against Maxime Rodinson in Structuralist Anthropology, where Rodinson criticizes him for what he perceives as uh, his anti-Marxism. And Levi-Strauss says, actually, you haven't read Marx properly, because Marx actually thought that these dynamics of the contradiction of productive forces only happen in, in class societies with states, and he quite explicitly, and in some of the ethnological notebooks as well, doesn't think that they necessarily pertain to so-called primitive societies, which then basically leads Levi-Strauss to saying, well, there are you know, different kinds of histories, and not all of them take the form that a historical materialism of uh, 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 you know, complex modes of production uh, requires. Um, so, t -t 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 uh, disagreements amongst uh, colonizers, refusal of enslavement. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that of course, get, I, get, I guess gets uh, um, I, I, ideologically and, 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 and polemically translated into the whole uh, uh, trope of the, of, not just the trope of the refusal of work, but then more disturbingly, because one should also give a sense of the other peculiar contradictions here, is that figures like Las Casas, who try to defend the indigenous uh, populations to an extent, 
even still treating them as children or whatever against the more virulent uh, 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 subjugation by the conquistadors, uh, present them as too weak to work. So present them in this kind of condescending uh, 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 um, uh, form uh, by saying, well, they can't be enslaved because they're not constitutionally able to work in industrial work. They're not made for it at some, you know, you know, because they're too noble or whatever the story is, because they're like children or, you know, etc. Leading Las Casas to say, maybe we should import black slaves, you know, so it's not, you know, so that, that th those, and, and that's where, you know, going to the kind of Afro-pessimism question in a sense, like, there's all sorts of very complex issues as to the relationship between the imaginary of the savage and other imaginaries of alterity and race, not least, of course, uh, against black populations, firstly as being elsewhere, and then, of course, qua slaves in the same uh, 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 territory. And that's, I think, a, a really um, tricky issue. Now, one of the things that that leads in some of these discourses is saying, oh, well, there's a total disanalogy, so you just have completely incomparable and detached forms of racialization, so you have anti-blackness as this thing which is completely of its own kind, and then you have, uh, uh, you know, anti-indigenous, and, and I, I'm not, uh, you know, but that's a very long story, I don't find that, that position uh, uh, um, persuasive, though it is definitely the case that there are very, there are quite distinct histories, and one of the things that all the historians note is that uh, European philosophers were very, you know, at different points, not all of them, but exhibited an interest anthropological and philosophical in indigenous population of the Americas that they never had for uh, uh, African uh, uh, civilizations, about which they knew a lot more in many, in, in, through many accounts and had known for longer. So that demands a uh, uh, different... Uh, um, development, and I, you know, the, I, I haven't looked at those <laughs> uh, um, images, but it's definitely something I'd be uh, uh, very um, keen to uh, follow up on. I mean, it's, I, think, I think the point about, um, I think the point, one of the issues about also the Lockean account, and, and this also goes back to the point about, you know, what, what, what material were these, uh, um, were actual colonists working with? So I think at, at different points, it's, it, it's, it's tricky to trace um, which are the operative ideological, uh, which are the operative texts and also which are the operative ideological frameworks. So, yes, Lockeanism generally has massive influence, but then, you know, who is operationalizing? You know, is it a particular lawyer or jurist or somebody who's, you know, it's not, I think there's, there's a, a risk that one, can, that one can enter into, including what I've, I've been talking about, to just uh, project in a quite a historical way that somehow there's this kind of uh, uh, Lockean, uh, uh, or you know, at other points Montesquieuian or uh, Adam Smithian uh, uh, effect on colonialism, whilst I think then it becomes uh, trickier and, and very interesting to follow, well, which texts and which, and, and through whom, because obviously a lot of the people engaging in the, colon in the activity of colonizing and of empire are, you know, are not you know, trying to be faithful to these, these philosophers and actually operating with all sorts of weird mediations. That's why some of these texts, for instance, this Giuliano Liozzi text is very interesting to show how some of the weirdest, uh, uh, most cracked and philosophically incomprehensible <laughs> Uh, uh, theories providing legitimate title, including you know bizarre speculations about Atlantis or whatnot, find their way into some very significant uh, uh, colonial situations in ways that you know the 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 a lot of the more philosophical treatments are just for uh, are just for an internal European consumption. I mean that's the other element. A lot of the a lot of the figure of the savage, including the case of Montaigne, is a, is a total internal trope. It's a it's a figure of intern of a, it's a pseudo mirror uh, or a pseudo inversion that's used for a, an argument among men of letters to criticize the limits of their own civilization. Sometimes as a trope, like in the Persian, the other as a trope to criticize certain forms of Christianity or Catholicism or Protestantism that you couldn't criticize otherwise. So I think we have to be quite you know uh, nuanced in seeing how and, and and through what actual operations these things are really. Uh, working. So I think that's as. I think there was one question, the very first oh. question about modern discourses. Ah, know. yes, yes. Um, we'll so that's, uh, I mean, I guess that partly links to this, the, the, what, what I was trying to, partly trying to suggest is a contrary to some of the uh, 
historical arguments that say, well, you have this kind of caesura, so you move from the formalistic negation to then a fine-grained positive account of ethnology or comparative anthropology, etc. Still seems to me that, including in the degree zero that Plaster <laughs> talks about, an, an element of that negation is present. Now, I, I think, you know, to the extent that the sedimentations of these Scottish Enlightenment uh, ideologies go very deep, and, you know, there are still, you know, think tanks called, you know, the Adam Smith Institute or whatever, that, uh, that are happy to promulgate them, then, you know, in some sense it goes. Now, the interesting thing would be to think, well, what are the, what are the ways in which this, this plays out? And, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the more obvious ones, uh, I guess, I mean, from a total uh, amateur uh, outsider standpoint about issues of, of, of development and whatnot, but... Uh, you know, one of them which seems very obvious is the, the particular relationship that uh, questions of property and la land title have to imaginaries of uh, social uh, complexity, um, you know, individual emancipation and so on, from schemes to give title to people in favelas, to microcredit, to what have you. There is a very powerful notion that you cannot have uh, uh, certain <coughs> forms of subjectivity, social relation, pacification of, uh, 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 of behavior, unless you first have certain forms of property, you know, certain, certain property forms, you know, which can get quite specific, you know, whether it's the ability to have a bank account, or whether it's the ability to own property, or to be able to rent, or whatever. And I think those, you know, those mechanisms, in some way, do seem to bear some not, not, not in significant formal analogies to, to uh, not, not the, so much the Hobbes and Locke and so on, but what comes after um, these uh, discourses that make, beginning with Montesquieu and then through the Scottish Enlightenment, that make the link between ways of living understood through the link between subsistence and ownership, and then from there build the question of of laws and, 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 and politics and, and human engagement. And so that, that seems to me still, I mean, I'm happy to be contradicted, but it seems to be still to be quite a powerful way of thinking. It doesn't mean that it's mapping those ideologies or philosophies from late 18th century into the present, but I think it's, it's, it's a kind of... Well, the notion of lack is very much yeah. there, especially from Latin American writers like Escobar or others, who also use the term lack in terms of what development is supposed to fill. And uh, obviously these days you have essays floating around saying we did not colonize Africa for long enough, uh, we left too soon, or failed state discourses. Or, or even the whole idea that democracy is a habit. Yeah, it's a yeah, habit. So yeah. But also because because haven't, that, had the, haven't built the habit. Yeah, the 600 years did not elapse before we got decolonized out of Africa <laughs> and stuff like that. Had we been there for longer, they would have been more like us and the world would be a better place. So. This is such an interesting discussion. However, I do want to give um, the audience the chance to ask a few more questions before we finish. So we can take, we have time for a couple more. If you want to put your hand up. There's one there. There's one over there. Ah, and then one over there. Uh, I would like to know if you have uh, followed in Brazil the development of the image of the good savage mm. that developed in the 19th century and it was used, it was really important for Brazilian nationalism uh, among, especially in literature. Especially? Especially in, li in literature. Uh -huh, yeah. And, uh, the Brazil in the pen, after Brazil independence. And it was used as a way to construct the, ima the image of the, reconstruct the image of the savage as a good savage of docile and to pacify them mm. at the 19th and 20th century. Mm. And another question that I would like to ask, if this image of the savage that you uh, constructed, how does it relate to the older images of barbarians and before the colonization of the Americans, mm. of the Americas? Um, yeah, firstly, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is a little bit about 
and I missed some of the earlier questions, so I hope I'm not repeating anything, um, what the political responses should be of people who are defined as savages or as barbarians, if you're, we're assuming that we don't want to assimilate into or integrate into the structures that oppress and degrade them or us. And the main reason why I'm, this question is coming to me is from a book that I read over the summer called Decolonial Judaism, um, which very much looks at the sort of continuum between civilization and barbarianism. Um, and basically talks about how one of the strategies of um, Jewish thinkers like Marx or Luxembourg and the Frankfurt School was a negative counter-narrative of bar barbarism, whereby you say it's the people who are coming over here and committing genocide and ecocide who are the actual barbarians. And then there's, um, so the author then looks at um, changes in post-Holocaust Jewish thought whereby there became a positive reappropriation of what it, of barbarism and people who said I think it's Isaac Deutscher who said, I mean, I'm, I'm an incurable barbarian, and they sort of positively reappropriate what it means to be a barbarian or what it means to be a savage. So I'm wondering, yeah, how you fall along those sort of lines of a negative counter-narrative or a positive reappropriation of, of these discourses. Mm. Um, we, sorry, oh, just, sorry, we have time for one more question, if anyone has one more. No? And we have these two very important ones. Um, so the... Um, uh, starting with the, 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 the last one again. I mean, I think the, um, a, any, pe you know, any pejorative, I mean, it's a sort of issue of the politics of rhetoric in, in one sense that is somewhat general. You know, any pejorative uh, ascription given particular conditions can uh, be flipped in some sense or appropriated or, uh, um, but, you know, those conditions are not always present and it might always, not always be why. So, yes, you do have the, the we barbarians or, you know, even one could even, you know, like, uh, like some of the Brazilian avant-garde celebrate, uh, uh, you know, anthropophagy or, or cannibalism as a kind of, you know, and is that sort of revivifying primitivist uh, 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 reference or indeed one can... Um, uh, one can engage in saying yes, the, the civilized are the real barbarians, which I think is possibly a, a more a more common one because it functions uh, in the mode of identifying a kind of hypocrisy. This is already present in in uh, in Montaigne, uh, who um, um, you know who, who talks already in the 1500s in, in a weird essay called Of Coaches, which is literally about coaches, but then starts denouncing uh, uh, colonialism in the most uh, extreme senses of saying, you know, he talks about the bar, he talks about the millions passed by the sword. I mean, it's, it's just a claim to genocide made, you know, not not so long after the beginning of the of the conquest. So that that's uh, um, possible. Now, <laughs> far be it for me to answer anything which involves shoulds, especially for other people, uh, but. Uh, I do think it's. I, I do think it's. In, I think it is interesting to see um, the. Um, yeah, I mean to, to 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 see, given the whole weight of this um, of these apparatuses of, of of you know negating people's political existence, uh, uh, um, placing them at a degree zero, and so on and so forth. What exactly are forms of collective political subjectivity that uh, that that various forms of indigenous movements have? And they, you know, and they obviously vary uh, a lot. And uh, and some might, you know, some might involve forms of identification that are across um, uh, ethnic or group differences. And some 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 might be very much, you know, claims of sovereignty based by a very particular group in a very particular. Situations you can see, yeah. I mean, you 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 know. I think you can only answer those issues as the, you know they are issues of strategy and and, and and rhetoric and reflection that people engage in on a quotidian basis uh, um, uh, politically. That I think also differ very much in terms of what is the um, what is the uh, apparatus of the state that they're responding to. I mean, it is interesting in this. I mean, I think that there was that question about the you know, the Afro-pessimism thing before. I mean, one of the interesting things that I think m makes it superficially seem that these are very different discourses is that, of course, the, 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 the nature, I mean, especially in North America and especially in the United States, 
the, the nature of the history of slavery is such that it doesn't necessarily involve uh, a, or hasn't for a long time since the 1930s mainly involved claims for territorial sovereignty and it seems to have it seems to make claims about about black identity and black power that are not uh, um, you know that are not fine-grained or granular or group specific in the same way that one might encounter in, uh, uh, in, in indigenous people that still differentiate them very, themselves very much from other indigenous people in the same broad speaking kind of states. So, but I think it's a very, you know, it is a very interesting point. I mean, regarding the, you know, the, regarding the question of, I mean, I, I, I know very distantly about the history of these uh, 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 issues in, in Brazil, I guess two, two things Come, yeah, I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind, which I guess is, is an even more uh, uh, um, distur you know, disturbing history, is a particular way in which, um, s you know, at least in the United States case, um, the whole, you know, the whole settler colonial imaginary is both, uh, is both genocidal and appropriative because it, 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 it actually then tries to in, infuse the, the imaginary and the, and the subjectivity of the settler with aspects of what they have romanticized as the, as the so-called savage or the Indian or et cetera. And that's really, you know, so that, that, that whole thing that happens, for instance, you can find in this, uh, you know, grotesque uh, uh, 19th century U.S. Uh, uh, paintings where you see the, you know, the heroic figures of the, you know, the, the savage as the heroic uh, figure which is in no way a critique of the very process that 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 led you know to to, to their dispossession and and murder and so on. So I think that's also very very peculiar the way that some that the, the savage in particular actually because this is something which is quite specific which of course doesn't have the same role in terms of the slave or the coolie or what you know tons of other figures of subjection. There's something about and I, you know about the history of the, of the savage as an ideological entity, which somehow allows for this very sinister paradoxical operation, which is to, to, to symbolize as well as to, you know, to, or to give some kind of exalted role whilst in no way criticizing continued subjugation and dispossession. I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know how to, you know, analyze or, or, or get to that, but I do think it's a, it's a really striking phenomenon that might say something about the difference between that and figures of, you know, again, also older figures like the, the barbarian or whatever. Can I just briefly say, you can look at British paintings from the same time and you'll probably see very similar representations. Like uh, the colonies bearing uh, Britannia taking gifts from the colonies is a big painting. And you've got savages, black people, uh, helping Britannia as she takes the fruit and the gold and the wheat coming from around the world. I mean, that's, that just reminded me when I was when I was working on that book on, yeah. on fanaticism. This yeah. only came to mind now, but it was, it was really striking to find in these letters written by uh, um, by soldiers and administrators on the so-called uh, you know kind of colonial uh, uh, frontier, you know, places that would not be, I guess, like Waziristan and so on. This. Uh, you know, their whole figure of the fanatic being also this figure, you know, he's both the enemy to be va vanquished, but he's also weirdly the repository of all of these bizarre, you know, eroticized martial, imagine, you know, they're, you know, they're heroic, you know, we have to kill them all, but, you know, they're great fighters, blah, blah, blah. So there's also that image, you know, in, in this other context, which is quite, uh, uh, which is quite potent and somehow serves also to, legitimize the, 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 the very activity of, of warring and indeed of, of extermination as a kind of classical uh, um, conflict between honorable soldiers rather than, you know, even if to the death, rather than a, a, an administrative militarized land grab. So I think that, that might be, you know, one yeah. kind of analogy. Do you have any closing comments? No. I have not. Except for thank you for it yes, um, so I think we've got to the end now. It just, um, just leaves me to <coughs> thank Alberto um, hugely for a really interesting talk, and thank you, Subir, as well.